Hello, everybody. My name is Zela Astarjan, and I am AWA Central Board Member, and I am your host today. I welcome you to another of AWA's virtual events. Today, we have an open conversation about how to deal with transgenerational trauma. This topic is now more important than ever, as our country faces yet another tragedy. This was going to be one of our panels during the AWA conference in Yerevan this week, but our community has been through so much in recent events that we decided to host this as a webinar. So we are very um, encouraged that we have folks joining us from all over the world. Like Lindsay said, we have Quebec, uh, Israel, Lebanon, Prague, London, Argentina, uh, of course, a lot from the U.S. and all over the U.S. Uh, so I'm very encouraged. I think even Idaho, if I'm not mistaken. Um, please put in the chat, actually, what city or country you are joining us from. That will give us an idea of who we have on the uh, on this webinar. Uh, webinar format today, um, the participants are muted, and there's going to be time for Q&A. So please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen. And also let us know what future webinar topics you want us to cover. Um, even though the, we postponed the AWA conference that was supposed to take place this week, um, we have several AWA leadership members at Ivan right now meeting with various officials to determine what our future focus should be. We, before we get into the discussion today, I want to remind you about AWA's mission and three pillars that we are currently focusing on. Our mission is simple, it's to connect and elevate Armenian women globally. Uh, and uh, as to how we elevate Armenian women, we do that through three strategic focus areas. Number one, health and wellness, supporting a woman's right and power to be aware and in control of her mental, physical, emotional, psychological well-being. Today's webinar falls into this category. We also support domestic violence programs. Our second area of focus is education. We believe that to educate is to liberate, and we do that by giving thousands of scholarships every year. Uh, last year, I think we gave over 80,000 in scholarships. The third area of focus is economic empowerment, because without financial freedom, women have to sometimes make some really difficult choices. Let me introduce you to our moderator today, Lindsay Hagopian. Lindsay has been an active member of the Armenian community for many years and most recently serves as chairwoman of the A1 New England chapter. She has spent 15 years in the advertising industry and has been teaching yoga since 2015. In 2021, she founded Purusha Wellness, which is a therapeutic yoga practice that takes a trauma-informed approach to helping women move past roadblocks in their lives using breathwork, somatic movement and meditation. Lindsay, take it away. Thank you, Zella. Um, and I am also gonna introduce our two panelists today, uh, Seta and Talin. Seta Haig was born in Lebanon and lived in Saudi Arabia and Cyprus. She moved to the US and um, attended university where she decided to pursue a career in mental health. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist who's been working at D.D. Hirsch Mental Health Services for the past 11 years as a clinician, lead clinical supervisor, program coordinator for the Armunity Program, and currently assistant program director. She's passionate about decreasing the stigma about, about mental health and addiction in the Armenian community, and she's seen how effective integrated care can be at addressing the whole person um, and is a great advocate for integrated mental health treatment. Um, she also has a private practice in Glendale. She is joining us from Armenia right now. And uh, Talene Kachumian is a licensed clinical social worker who earned her master's in social work from Columbia University School of Social Work and an undergraduate degree in psychology from UCLA. Talene was born in Sweden, where she spent a significant portion of her childhood and then moved to L.A. with her family. After seven years of working as a school social worker with children and families in New York and L.A., she made the transition to working in private practice online um, to become more involved in Armenia. 
After the war in 2020, she actually moved to Armenia to join the mental health efforts with soldiers, their families, and others affected by the war. And she spent a large amount of time training local therapists and psychology students on topics like grief, trauma, suicide prevention, and assessment. So um, we're really excited to have them here today and to have this discussion as a community. As Ella mentioned, it is a very important topic. I've heard intergenerational trauma, um, transgenerational trauma uh, throughout my uh, network and also with some other individuals in the Armenian community. And it hasn't really been addressed that much. Um, and we're gonna get into a discussion talking about, you know, what it really is, the signs and symptoms, and just some of the, the coping mechanisms that we can use. I do wanna also just mention it's not therapy. It doesn't take the place of therapy. If anyone is in need of any resources, you can reach out to any of us. We'll put contact information in, in the chat and, and can refer you to anything. Um, so we're going to get started with our session. Just to start out, we're going to ground ourselves with a bit of an exercise, a relaxation exercise. And um, if you all are, you're all, I'm sure, sitting or in some position in front of your computer. So take a moment to um, really just ground yourself in your seat and bring your awareness into the present moment. And if it feels comfortable for you, you're welcome to close your eyes. And let's start by taking three cleansing deep breaths in, take an inhale into your heart, and then an exhale, breathe out through your feet. And again, deep breath in, and exhale, breathe out. And one more, breathe in and exhale, release. And as you sit here, just notice if there's anything else you, any other shape or position or adjustment you wanna make to yourself to make your body a little more comfortable than it is. And take a moment to shift your awareness from whatever you were doing before just into this space and this time that you're in right now, the present moment. And do a scan of your body from the crown of your head all the way down through your feet. Notice any physical sensations you might be feeling. And then bring your awareness to your mind. It may feel a little uncomfortable just if any thoughts are passing through. Label them as energy. And then notice your breath. Notice where it goes. Notice where it might be getting stuck. Is it long or short, deep or shallow? And we'll start with, we'll do a little bit of a three-part breath technique. Three-part breath in, uh, breaks up the inhale into thirds. So you'll breathe in a third into the belly, in a third into the low ribs, in a third into the upper part, part of the rib cage, and then slowly breathe out. Breathe in a third, breathe in a third, breathe in a third, and slowly breathe out. And again, breathe in, Breathe in, breathe in, and then slowly breathe out. And just do a few more rounds on your own. Taking your own pace.
And just take two more rounds. Inhale. 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 And breathe out. Good. And just take a moment to release the technique. Settle in. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. And so we'll start our conversation today um, with the question, what is transgenerational trauma or complex trauma? Um, and, and how does it really show up in our communities? And another question that's also been popping into my head as we've been planning this, as we shifted this to a webinar in light of the past few weeks, are we able to you know, start the healing process while there is still trauma taking place? So, um, that I, I think you were yeah. going to. You know, I think it is unbelievable that when we decided to have this topic in the conference, we had no idea that it would truly be at a time, <clears throat> even though it's in webinar form, at a time when we are experiencing another collective trauma collective loss and it so complicates our process of healing. But we will keep talking about how to heal even in these hardest times. And that will be kind of discussed a lot uh, in our uh, webinar. Transgenerational trauma is a concept that is really solidifying in the mental health and other communities and there's a lot of research and evidence to show that it is truly uh, there. It is the idea that generally subconscious transmission of traumatic experiences continue in subsequent generations in a people who have experienced a, a very severe collective trauma. So it's basically the effects of the trauma are being transmitted to the next generations for generations to come. And it people in the next generation find themselves showing symptoms, behaviors uh, of trauma without having experienced the trauma themselves. So my grandmother experienced the genocide, but now I'm showing symptoms and behaviors that clearly reflect that something is transmitted. And obviously one of the basic ways this happens is that we, it's behavioral. We observe our parents, our grandparents behaving in certain ways, be it fear and anxiety, and we'll talk more about these symptoms and behaviors. But there is a very interesting new area, relatively new area that is called epigenetics. Obviously this is not a scientific uh, webinar, but. It's this idea that through collective traumatic experiences, changes occur that affect the way the genes work in future generations. There is literally physiological changes. So not only is it environmentally experienced, yeah, my grandmother, my grandfather, my parents, and now me, and that here it is this new traumatic experience. It's also that there are changes in the myelin sheet of the neurons and their changes in genetics that are transmitted from one generation to the other, which is kind of, if you think about it, a huge finding and really kind of underscores how complex transgenerational trauma is through epigenetics. That's the kind of term that is used. And so we start thinking like, what is being transmitted? I mean, a lot of behaviors, symptoms, and um, some of the highlights that I wanna make is uh, things we see in our kind of uh, experience as Armenians of obviously uh, starting with the 1915 genocide and then so many other traumatic experiences. And sadly now this huge other experience that we're really going through right now, it hasn't even ended, it's obviously deeply affecting our past experiences of trauma. And I do have to say here that when there are so many 
traumatic experiences in a person's life and history, it becomes what we call complex traumatic experiences. It's not one or two experiences. It's much more complicated than that and has so much Im impact on our mental well-being, on our emotional well-being, or the challenges we face. So, and I do highlight this, that trauma is compounded so that if you have had three or four traumatic experiences, be it from the history of your people or personal traumatic experiences, they don't just add up to one plus one plus one equals three. It's one plus one plus one equals eight, 10. Because every new heavy experience really complicates the healing process. And sadly, I mean, we're experiencing this right now where I was in a place, I think, where, for example, I was coping better with, I don't even want to say coping, but dealing with my grandparents' trauma and trying to understand and heal. And here is this new trauma. So obviously the effects are going to be complicated. I'm triggered so much. I've shared this where like images of genocide that I've seen through my childhood are coming back to me. So it's really very severe and devastating that these uh, experiences add and become more and more challenging to deal with emotionally for any of us. Some of the ways that uh, transgenerational trauma really shows uh, are very simple and some are very complicated. For example, uh, in Armenians, there is so much uh, need to kind of, uh, I, I want to start a little light, and there's the need to kind of store food. A lot of Armenians I know, for example, have two refrigerators, like one is not enough. Mm -hmm. in the, even in the US, even in places where food is abundant, uh, we, we want to have enough of basic necessities because there's always fear in us that something may happen and we will not have food, something very basic. Another very clear kind of uh, behavioral, emotional kind of way that the people, our people show uh, like histories of trauma is our constant worry. We are always worried and thinking the worst is going to happen. When, some, when we're faced in a situation, most of us kind of think of the worst case scenario and kind of worry, uh, really struggle with it. And honestly, like thinking about what's happening today, no wonder, right? We, we think the worst and sometimes the worst has happened to us. So it's very understandable that this is how we deal with things, but think about how this affects our daily life. If every day, every situation we face makes us very worried, anxious, and we expect the worst, obviously this is a very anxious, stressed way of living life. So we really have to try to kind of cope or find better ways of coping because this is our general tendency as a people to worry and expect the worst. We also don't trust any institutions, any kind of organizations because they've really not been there for us. We are not trusting of the systems. And again, coming to today, no wonder, right? That we, we are very suspicious when um, countries or governments or institutions uh, promise us things. We are very suspicious because they haven't really been there for us in so many ways through the years. We give also a lot of importance to our future generation. We value our children. We want to raise them well. We want to educate them because obviously there is such a huge need and drive uh, in Armenians uh, to reproduce, to grow in numbers, to survive because of what happens happened to us. Um, a lot of what's happening right now honesty is also very basic symptoms of uh, PTSD. And then Talim will talk a little bit more about grief. It's a combination, honestly. We're experiencing so many kind of immediate symptoms as well. 
and a lot of these are um, due to so many traumatic experiences. Right now, we're experiencing a lot of irritability, a lot of rumination. A lot of our symptoms uh, express themselves as physical pains, physical symptoms, physical pains, illnesses. Uh, and it's it's not a coincidence that a lot of us are getting ill these days because there's a lot we're dealing with. And um, obviously, again, a lot of us are going through a sense of hopelessness. I know I am. I have my days when I try to be more hopeful again, but there's overall a sense of, you know, this is it. This is not going to get better. Things are going to get worse. And just kind of constantly thinking of um, things kind of getting worse and worse for us as Armenians and just kind of this overall sense of uh, negative negativity and hopelessness. So these are very common and I think so many of us are experiencing these right now. Every single Armenian, honestly, I think is experiencing some form of this right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an, I, if, and we also want to make this a little engaging. So if you notice any symptoms in yourselves, um, we have the Q&A. You can just drop any signs, symptoms that you are noticing um, just so we, just so you have that outlet to, to express that. Um, I think Seta going on some of the different physical symptoms, I, I, I noticed a lot of uh, um, Armenians are still in a fight or flight mode. And whether that's from the trauma that goes back generations to the 1915 genocide, or, um, you know, having lived in a, another war torn country and having fled another war in some way, shape or form, we are all in some sort of fight or flight mode that's been passed down for uh for generations and I just remember noticing in 2020 like everyone like we were all in this state of panic um as a collective and just even a little thing like living here in Boston but this fear of handing over like a credit card and worrying that there might have been a Turk on the other side of it um and I think that's that's also one of the symptoms we um, we have. That's an, also an indication of like dissociation, dissociation from your body, feeling disconnected. Your mind is disconnected from your body and the world around you, and it, it is a very, very uncomfortable feeling as well. Uh, I just wanted to add as well you know, when we're talking about how it manifests, I think every generation is so different. So like Seth was saying, the first generation of the survivors of the genocide, they might be, you know, it might manifest in silence. They might want to protect that information and not want to traumatize others, or maybe they want to assimilate and forget about what happened. And then we have sometimes second generation folks who are looking at their parents and thinking like what happened with curiosity. You know, I'm sure uh, lots of us in this room right now probably have parents who have escaped some kind of war, some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of trauma. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you look at your parents and, and they're not speaking about it. And yeah, you, you look at them and you wonder sometimes with curiosity, like what happened? And then you have the third generation and subsequent generations who deal with a lot of survivor's guilt, um, who might also be, you know, activists uh, because they have found out what happened and, um, yeah, that's, I think, also why there's a lot of pressure. And, um, you know, lots of people in America, maybe, I know we have people from all over the world, um, but lots of times people from America might feel this immense pressure to either, you know, marry within the race or, you know, be successful because of what their ancestors went through um, or have children, for example. That's a big one for us, too, this need to procreate. Um, you know, in, in Armenia, uh, there's this huge, huge push, especially for young couples. Every time, you know, people see the, a young couple, the first thing on their mind is, you know, you guys have to procreate. We need to have at least three kids uh, or at least five. We have, you know, everything is about what are we going to do for this next next generation? And it's a huge, it's a huge burden to bear. Uh, another point that I wanted to mention, 
that I think we were just talking about is, yeah, how do we, how do we heal from something that we're still going through? Um, it's this kind of, it's, it's a chronic state of trauma, you know, from the Hamidi massacres, from uh, Armenian genocide. And then, you know, we have the nineties wars and then we have 2020. Now we have 2023. It's like, you can't really heal because you're constantly being re-triggered. And imagine being in Artsakh too, for those folks who are living there um, or were living there, for them, every single time there was some news, it was, you know, here we go, we're re-traumatized. So in order to be, to, to heal from this, we have to be safe. We can't be in survival mode. So we have to be, you know, whatever that means, whatever safety means, we have to get to safety before we can start to heal. Uh, I think that's why we have such a hard time moving on. You know, there's a lot of people who will be like, you know, Armenians were always complaining about 100 years ago and we're always fighting about this and that is because we haven't we haven't gotten um, reparations we haven't gotten anyone to validate anything that that we've uh, been going through and we're continuing to go through it now so of course it's going to be really difficult to heal and move on from it when we haven't gotten that resolution uh and i just want to call out a couple people have um pinged in the chat you know response to the signs and symptoms of needing to feel seen and feeling invisible um, and also noticing a higher rate of blood pressure in the Armenian population because of the trauma and anxiety. And um, yeah, anxiety does cause some of those chronic illnesses. And also for the feeling to be seen and invisible, um, definitely echo that. I think as Armenians, we don't fall into any of the, you know, minority groups that are in the that we talk about in the US. I, I was actually in an inclusivity group um in in Boston, the Boston area for yoga and that was during 2020 during the war. And I remember talking about it to their group and explaining like what was going on and the struggles I was feeling and just a lot of these individuals who promote inclusivity just smiled and like nodded and it was <laughs> I, I echo that. I definitely echo that. So, um, and we will, we're going to um, address the questions uh, toward the end. So we will do that. Um, um, moving on to our next question though, how do we stop the cycle of transgenerational trauma? And like, can we really heal as it's happening? What a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had like a little magic wand that I can cure us all. Um, I think uh, one way to, to kind of uh, put it or to think about it is, you know, when we work with children who have been victims of abuse, for example, um, when you compare the trajectory of a child who has had a strong parent who has given them support, who has given them validation and told them, yes, I believe you, let's get help, um, you know, maybe get justice for that child. The tra trajectory and the outcome for that child is so much more positive than the child whose parent maybe gaslights them, says, no, uh, you know, you're at fault for this, or I don't believe you, I believe stepdad, or, um, you know, maybe getting uh, the police to not believe you or uh, to, to shame you for, for whatever reason. Um, the trajectory of that child is the outcomes for that child is so much more poor than the one who did get that support. Now, if we take that same concept and we apply it to us as a community, um, we don't get validation from the United States. We get the perpetrators who are continuing to perpetrate this violence towards us and, you know, deny what happened in the past and sometimes, you know, say, yeah, this, it's good that we did it, you know, like taunting us, uh, using a lot of psychological warfare. So, I, I wish and and ideally what would happen is that there will be institutional change. We can get institutional validation because I think if we look at, for example, Jews who went experienced the Holocaust, their outcomes are so much more different because they did get that reparation, that validation, um, the apologies and stuff like that. But here we are still fighting for our right to literally live in a place that we've been for a very, very long time. So if we cannot get that validation that we so um, desperately seek and want, and I saw that someone in the Q&A 
so that I feel invisible. Um, and that's so relatable. I think most of us feel that way that we're unheard. Um, but if we're not going to get that from the outside world, then we have to somehow figure out and you know build on our resources and our resilience, which we have. And I think it's really important that we highlight those things. Um, another thing I think, yeah, when we're talking about like psychological warfare, sometimes I know we talked about this, um, you know, when we look on Instagram, sometimes you see some ridiculous polls like Aliyev says that Khan is uh, an illegal construction or something like that. And, uh, you know, some of us are getting so angry, but this is literally what he's doing is trying to get under our skin. It's psychological warfare. And uh, we have to learn how to rely on ourselves to self-soothe and not try to get the, the world to realize that this person is crazy because we might never get that. We don't have control over anyone else. We have control over us and our community for the most part. Um, so yeah, and, and another thing uh, going off of that too, I don't know how many of us are working in environments with where there's not a lot of Armenians and maybe your boss is not understanding why you're not performing well. Maybe you're... You know, you have coworkers who are like, oh, well, I heard that there's two sides. You know, we heard a lot of that in 2020 and it just boils your blood and it's it's really upsetting and it, it re-triggers you and re-traumatizes you. It's as if, you know, the Turks are telling us again, like, oh, no, that didn't happen. So I think that's where, where there's a lot of strong reaction. Um, that's where a lot of our grief comes in as well, our anger. Um, so all that to say that one one big step that we have to do is First, we have to acknowledge that our grief and our trauma reaction can come in all forms. So we can be angry, we can be depressed, um, we, you know, we can question the world around us. Uh, all of those things could happen. We can be in denial and in shock. Some people might be like, ah, I'm not going to look at that. I'm just not going to pay attention to it because it hurts too much to even think about it. Something that we see a lot, uh, you know, I, I live in Armenia and um, something we see a lot, a lot is, you know, uh, people blaming uh, political parties, for example, that person is to blame. That person is to blame. The uh, these people are to blame. Um, you know, maybe we are to blame. There are so many different ways that people express that grief, and that could come in in all different forms. Same with the traumas. Uh, yeah, and and speaking on the building resilience, one thing that I love. So it's if we can reframe our thoughts based on this concept of post traumatic growth. If we can change our thoughts from we are the victims, I mean, let's acknowledge, yes, the really bad stuff has happened to us for a very, very long time. We're not going to take that away. We will acknowledge that. But we'll also take it from, yes, we are the victim all the, all the time. But it also is true that we are resilient people. We're a very resilient people. And uh, Seth and I were talking about this just right now, too, that, you know, since the 2020 war, so many diasporan Armenians, they came to uh, Armenia created a bunch of NGOs. And now what you're seeing is a result of that. So there's so much support out here. You see so many Armenians, even from the diaspora who don't live in Armenia, how much support there is. You don't see uh, people in tents here. You see people, Artsatsis in people's homes. You see Armenians taking, Ar taking care of Armenians. Um, it's just, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it and talking about it. We're just, we're an amazing people and we need to remember that. Our culture is still here. These people have been trying to kill us. We have genocidal neighbors <laughs> from every every direction, and we're still here. And um, I think that's pretty amazing. And I think that's something that if we can try to change our mentality a little bit too, we are still here. We're amazing people. Um, you know, there's so much amazing things, so many amazing things that are happening. Uh, and yeah, maybe we can even take to activism to make ourselves feel better. And I know in 2020, and I know, Seta, you can relate, um, you know, when we came here to help with the soldiers, you just, you feel so much better about what's going on. You feel like, okay, I'm doing something about it. I'm not just sitting and being hopeless. I'm, I'm here fighting the cause, doing something. Um, on that note, I think it's important when we're talking about traumas, you, you there is limits to that. You know, with the activism, there could come some um, vicarious trauma, which means when you are working with traumatized people. Sometimes you can absorb their trauma as well. So that's why it's important that we are doing this work and we also take care of ourselves. Um, other things that I was, I think that are important to know is uh, speaking about resilience is, okay, so uh, one thing that we talk about is as Armenians, we have this strong mistrust of authority, um, just a, a lot of people, a lot of institutions, um, maybe a lot of parents didn't let their children <laughs> sleep over 
their uh, their friends' houses. Uh, there's just a lot of mistrust in general in our community. And if we can, again, reframe that from something negative to something positive, we're teaching our children how to be critical of authority. You know, maybe when they get information to not just believe everything, question the resources. Maybe we're teaching our kids to, you know, be aware of their surroundings. So as much as this could be a trauma response, we can also look at it as like, we're teaching our kids how to be strong. We're teaching them how to be resilient and independent and just make wise choices. Um, lastly, actually, no, I have two more points. <laughs> so uh, another thing is, I think it's really important that we allow ourselves and we hold space for the grief. So I'll give you an example of, you know, like a grieving widow, for example. Um, what happens in our in our culture traditionally what for a year the widow has to wear black right um or sometimes if it's a man they don't shave for like 40 days or something like that it's just all about you know there, there's no music you, can, you can't listen to music you can't go out you can't enjoy life um in ways to respect and honor the person that has died right so yes it's important that we honor these people it's important that we honor our loved ones and we acknowledge what's going on, but at the same time, how do we do that and live our lives? You know, how do we continue to honor the, the dead, honor the people who have lost things, but continue to live? So, you know, we talk a lot about that with clients, especially soldiers who came back who were not able to enjoy anything. You know, they just came back from doing some some really, really traumatic stuff, but just didn't want to live life because they thought it was too disrespectful. So we would come up with ways of, okay, so how can you honor your friends, maybe going to their parents' house once a week or going to visit them at the graves and the cemetery, but at the same time, allowing yourself to go to the gym, to to live a healthy lifestyle um, or to, you know, um, hang out with your friends because that's going to keep you sane and that's going to keep you able to move on and move forward. Uh, okay, so so you know when we're talking about transgenerational and in, intergenerational, uh, we have to remember that what we're doing is we're passing things on to our children, and you know maybe their children, whether they've experienced what has happened or not. So it's really important how we talk to our children about what's going on. So like Seth was saying, and I think I can relate to that too. How many of us have seen those images of? Armenian schools on the floor or you know like dead emaciated children uh in ditches and stuff like that you know so like those are not images that maybe we should see as young young children but we can have age-appropriate conversations about you know really sad things happen in different parts of the world you know teaching kids empathy encouraging them to maybe help uh one thing I I really like I don't know if anyone is aware of uh home and men what they do I know my my little sister actually was um, helping kids write letters to soldiers or letters to autopsies, teaching them empathy, teaching them that, okay, sad stuff is happening. What can we do to make the world a better place? You know, teaching them again, that resilience. What can we do? How can we show up for our, for our other Armenians? Um, yeah, and that's where I think supportive community environment and institutional support comes in. We're not gonna get it from places like USC. We're not gonna get it from the American government. We're not getting it from anywhere. So this is why those types of communities are important. We're important. These types of spaces and forums are important. We don't have control over anyone else. And then uh, moving on. So what are some of the supports that we can leverage moving forward? Definitely, I want to remind everyone that this is a time to really give yourself, each and every one of you, the space and the compassion that you need while going through all this. And this is a really, really hard time for each and every one of us Armenians. So just be kind and compassionate to yourself. I think accept that you're not 100% there emotionally and in so many other ways. So if you're struggling with some areas of your life, that is the way it is. It is the reality of what we're going through. So just be kind to yourselves. If you're not performing a hundred percent, if you're needing to take a few days off work or whatever that may be. So I really wanna highlight this point that we are struggling and 
we're all struggling, the young and the elderly and everyone, every single one of us. And if things that reach a point where you're struggling so much that you're you're not able to function for weeks and weeks on end or unable to sleep, when things are really complicated for whatever reason, because don't forget a lot of these things we're hearing and seeing are bringing up a lot of other losses and traumatic experiences from our past. So if things are becoming really complicated for us, please, please consider getting professional help. It's out there, it's available uh, to us. But there's so many other ways that we're all, I think, able to find right now to start healing while going through all this. And I think one of the ways we, we can do this is first of all, just focus on not spending the whole day processing what's going on. We have to, we have to find ways of kind of getting away emotionally, mm -hmm. mentally from what is going on. We can't be on our phones 24 seven checking what the latest update is. It just so self-destructive, honestly. I know it's so tempting. tempting. I've been there, I am there some days, some hours, but it just doesn't help. It doesn't help, it doesn't make a difference and it really takes away from how you can deal with, with your day. Um, one of the ways that we as Armenians have to heal during this time is just going to church. Uh, I know that one of the most powerful and healing experiences I've had in Armenia in the past week is going to Goshavank a few days ago and uh, my husband was singing Dervo Hormia and a few friends and all of us were standing in the church and crying and uh, lighting candles and the Derhair said a few amazing words and there was a, a sense of kind of letting go a little bit even though obviously we're all questioning why this is happening to us a Christian nation the first Christian nation but still, it, that was healing. And I think it's true for so many of us that uh, the church and um, our sharagas give us so much comfort. Um, also, I think crucial is being with like-minded people, people who really understand us, especially when we live in places where work is not that maybe, or there aren't other uh, kind of systems set up, just making sure we're talking to people who really listen, understand, uh, reflect, mirror our feelings and uh, emotions and are just present. Uh, family, friends are key at this time. Please try not to isolate. This is not the time uh, to just hide and not uh, interact with anyone because you are struggling. This is a time to talk and kind of uh, get give each other support because we're all in this together. Honestly, don't forget. And uh, other general ways, obviously, reaching out to nature, any kind of nature, uh, exercising, uh, walking, yoga, movement, and any kind of community events where we can uh, kind of um, feel the strength of our culture, our music, our art. All these are going to really help us in healing. And I think, um, Sati, you mentioned staying off of your phone. And I think I, I've been taking those chunks of time to be away from the phone more than I did back in 2020. And it it does really, really help a lot. Um, and I think one of the questions is how does one do self-soothing? And I know we were holding on questions, but it does dovetail nicely into here. But um, from like a more specific type of like yoga practice, like I lean on breath work a lot. Um, and in general, you when if you want to learn or if you want to assess your own nervous system and the different stages, there are a couple different stages that you might be feeling like the jitters, uh, the anxiety, like the real like 
activation. Um, and then there's even a state beyond that, which is where you get so burnt out, you're sluggish and you're tired. And so depending on where you are, if you're feeling that more jittery anxiety, or if you're feeling more of that sluggishness, you may want to do more rigorous exercise. So if you're more sluggish, you're going to want to, you know, cultivate some opposite, the opposite feeling in general, um, you know, maybe pushing yourself to go for a little bit of a run or, um, you know, a brisk walk or um, taking up space with your movement, opening up, which is going to help you take up space and counter that, that hunched up over feeling. Um, and if you're feeling more activated than doing, you know, some of that slow breathing that we did at the beginning, that's really helpful for downregulating your nervous system um, and, you know, resting, doing some still exercises. So. When we were uh, kind of discussing uh, this webinar together, uh, we really wanted to hear from uh, the uh, participants. Um, what are ways that help you cope and heal during this time? Because it can be as simple as doing crochet or cooking Armenian food to really kind of deep stuff that we we that help with healing. So we'd love to kind of see some responses in the chat of what helps you heal. Hiking, yeah. Yeah, definitely hiking, yeah, both hiking. exercise and nature. It's a win win. Um, anyone who's in the LA, the California area, there's a wonderful person. Her name is Elena. I'm going to find her last name, but she does nature immersions and forest therapy. Um, she's mm -hmm. based in Ojai, so you can find her yeah nature and play, um, playing yeah. piano music is amazing I totally agree yeah Elena journaling Leo. oh wow great hot baths yeah avoiding the news love these comments breath exercises meditation mm -hmm. art definitely creative anything creative is going to help Love these. Coffee with reading. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking Armenian. It's almost like asserting that we're alive and we're going to continue speaking our language. That's how I feel. Yeah, music, literature. Um, Holding my cat. That's okay. my favorite. Oh. creative practices for sustaining action yeah. Writing yeah. Yeah. getting involved in the community yeah that's a good reminder of something uh, that comes up helping is so healing it's amazing right that even though we need the help ourselves but helping others is still very healing so in whatever way without overdoing it obviously uh, because we're struggling helping gardening beautiful comments beautiful it's interesting that for some people talking about it letting it out is is helpful and for some people trying to distract and and not avoid but you know distract and do other things is also helpful and Again, a reminder, there's no right and wrong. Whatever you need to do, mm -hmm. just give yourself the grace and the space to deal with things, definitely. And Tallinn, I have a question. How about women in Armenia? Like what, you know, I feel like, or Artsakh right now, how, how are they going to be able to deal with this? What's your, what are your thoughts, both of all of you? Um, 
well, I can I can only say what from my experience in 2020, um, a lot of these women are coming in and I think in survival mode. So right now they're just trying to survive, you know, finding shelter and food. And I think a lot of them are just trying to stay strong for their families. A lot of them, maybe their husbands had to stay behind. Uh, maybe they lost lost their husbands. Um, so from what I noticed with a lot of these women is just they're just really, really strong and really, really uh yeah, they're just they're trying to be the rock for their families, which on one hand, you know, it's it's so admirable. And then on the other hand, you wonder, you know, what's what kind of trauma that they're holding in and what they're not releasing and and things like that. But they've been dealing with this for so long, for decades. I feel like not that they're used to it, you know, because who who can get used to something like that? Yeah. But it is something that I feel like they've it's it's happened so many times and they've lost so much and they've had so much grief that it's again, you know, another one of those things is the, the chronic trauma that's coming up for them. My, my hope. And I think after 2020, the government and just people in general have shifted to towards mental health a lot more. I think people are a lot more open to get support and help now. Whereas before then, I feel like there was just a huge stigma, a huge taboo, but now psychologists are being deployed at every hospital there's so many psychologists available free therapy for uh, lots of the victims so I think there's a lot of really good stuff in that way there's a lot of support and people are taking advantage of it when yeah, I went what... into the Armenian uh, Red Cross yesterday it was amazing they were doing a needs assessment like you could hear the questions and one of the basic questions was do you need mental health treatment I think what a shift that is this is yeah. amazing. That's huge. Um, so, so you I, think I people are using therapists more and more because there might be a taboo in the olden days. I mean, there's um, still just like there is in America, I feel. Um, but it's not there's not as much resistance as there was in the past. Yeah. People are a lot more yeah. likely, especially when they see really uh, severe symptoms of PTSD. I think people are a lot more likely to get that yeah. support. And I think right now they're dealing with the basic needs, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's like survival, food, shelter, clothing, uh, just, but in weeks to come, I'm sure that more people will access mental health treatment. Lindsay, we have a couple of good questions. Yeah. So want to get yeah, to I'm those? Gonna, yep. I'm going to get, I wanted to get to the questions. So, um, so we have, do you think Armenians are culturally culturally or not as inclined towards speaking about their emotional struggles or trauma? I think they've definitely learned that from their, uh, the it's the behavioral part of transgenerational trauma, I think. We've learned that from our parents, grandparents, that, you know, it's too painful. We don't talk about it. If we talk about it, it's going to hurt the other family members. So might as well. I think it's our worry about kind of, affecting the our loud ones so it's i think generally what we have modeled for our family members is that you keep feelings inside especially uh, painful feelings and you don't express because it's it is going to affect them negatively as well i think generally we're not a culture that is open to just sitting and talking about feelings mm -hmm. so there has to be a shift in that that it's yeah, okay they... to talk and cry together, you know, instead of saying, you know, I'm not going to say anything so she doesn't get upset, my daughter, my sister, my brother. Yeah, and there's a related question to that. How do Armenians in Armenia, well, it's more, uh, more about Armenia, but how do Armenians in Armenia react to therapy and counseling? Are they open to it or have we seen a shift? Yeah, I think definitely uh, from yeah. what, I, what I covered. There's been a huge shift. There's mm -hmm. still a lot of people when I tell them, you know, hook up on them. Sometimes they'll be like, do you guys really do anything? You know, it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes that's also a defense mechanism. I feel like they're kind of probing and asking, like, what can you do for me versus like you can't do anything, you know? Um, but yeah, in general, I feel like there's a, a more openness to it. Um, and then just two more questions. Um, I think we'll go maybe like, 10 minutes over if everyone is okay. Um, but I'm currently studying to be a physician assistant. How can Armenians utilize the medical system to process this? 
is there evidence of increased inflammation, neurological symptoms, can medication management be helpful? I wonder if the question is referring to Armenia or just Armenians in general. So um, Alexandra is from here. Um, she's one of our A1 Next Gen uh, young women. She's very bright. Um, I have a feeling from this perspective, you know, from here, and, and, and maybe both. I mean, I think definitely there, uh, there is definitely an overlap with the medical system and with mental health. We do refer people to psychiatrists sometimes. Talk therapy is not enough and people do need mm -hmm. medication. Um, yeah, and sometimes mental health symptoms could exacerbate physical symptoms or physical symptoms can ex exacerbate mental health uh, symptoms. So it's important, I think, to talk yeah. to doctors as well. And, yeah, and I, I think, think definitely I... in Armenians, it's safer to express emotions in physical ways. It's, yeah. it's mm -hmm. less taboo. So we tend to have headaches and backaches and this mm -hmm. and that. So it's interesting, the program that... Uh, the immunity program that was in my biography that I run, uh, we have a partnership with a ch chiropractor and it has been so effective because truly mm -hmm. there is a lot of uh, physical symptoms. So acupuncture, chiropractor care really helps with the mental health issues as well. It's yeah. all um, related. Also, it's more of like a type, but the book Body Keeps the Score mm -hmm. um, by Bessel, Bessel. I don't know if either of you... Um, have your perspective I on it. I love that I book. love that I mean, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, trauma is it. in there. If you don't process trauma, it's going to come out in so enlightening, some I ways. Think. I mean, for example, yeah. there's clear, yeah, and there's so much research that people who've experienced trauma tend to later on sadly have, are much more likely to have physical illnesses, like even cancer, mm -hmm. definitely autoimmune diseases. So, we need to really kind of be mindful of mm -hmm. kind of processing our trauma, however that may be. It's not only therapy. It's just something we need to do. Yes, uh, Shiatsu and Felden craves. Um, yeah, I just studied with a, a yoga teacher who is also influenced by Felden craves, and it's yeah. really, really yeah. effective. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there's yeah. one more question. How do you distinguish if you do from being angry, sad, or motivated about what has occurred to ancestors and actually inheriting trauma, which implies this occurs beyond our individual choice or control? Hmm. That's a deep question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very interesting question. I love it. Yeah. So how are we I, distinguishing it from, from generational trauma versus what's happening right now? Is that, am I getting that right? Yeah. Yeah. I think in, in general, if that is the main way that you deal with things consistently, it's deeper than just immediate kind of responses that are very appropriate. I mean, not that the other one is a, but if it's as a community, as a people, as an individual, this is your way of dealing with any difficult situation, I would say, say there's more stuff going on there, be it from your family of origin or transgenerational trauma. What do you I think, think Tani? Also, that was a great answer. Um, I think it's also, it's so difficult, I think with mental health, Sometimes we want to pinpoint an answer. We have to, you know, why am I like this sometimes? You know, what is the reason? You know, I work with a lot of parents and sometimes they're like, why is my kid depressed? And it's it's like, it's such a hard question because it's, you have to look at the person holistically. You know, it could be environment. It could be your genetics. It could be family life. It could be something that happened to you when you're younger, trauma. So there's so many different things. So, uh, or it could just be normal. Like I'm, you know, I'm just experiencing feelings, but I think Seth was right in that. Uh, you know, let's let's look at is this something that you have always been this way? Or are you reacting to a certain situation? Um, and mm -hmm. is this diagnosable? You know, is this yeah. symptoms? Yeah. Of and also, I think, and we do that a lot, asking like, how did your parents 
deal mm -hmm. with difficult situations, if it's continuing from generation to generation. And a lot of times, like the person realizes, hey, this is exactly how my mom dealt with difficult situations. So it's it's deeper mm -hmm. than just the incident or the situation. Um, and then Anna, Anna said sometimes getting too long in self-destruction gets people distracted. And um, I, I do want to acknowledge that comment as well. Um, you know, in, in, you know, some of the yoga philosophy, there is this um, belief that suffering, suffering is inevitable. Um, and we're meant to feel the feelings around suffering. But then beyond that, we do have, it's in our human nature that we perpetuate the suffering, just our mind continues to unravel. And so Tali, and I know it, you mentioned, you know, feeling your grief and feeling your feelings, you know, it's important to acknowledge that and hold space for it. And then we have a choice on whether we move forward one way or if we continue down that spiral of, of you know, misery for lack of a better word. Exactly. But the way we do it and how long it takes is very individual. There's no right and wrong way. There's no time limit. Obviously, if it's years and you're still struggling, uh, s some professional help may be needed. But in general, grief and loss, as well as uh, PTSD or trauma reactions are very individual in how you cope mm -hmm. and what you need to do to process. Yeah, and for Deborah's latest comment, yes, I've I've actually heard it goes back as far as seven generations that we may have felt we may be mm -hmm. feeling remnants of, and then we are impacting seven generations ahead of us. So it's just something to be mindful, mindful of. Yeah, exactly. This sense of is this the beginning of a, uh, several more generations of transgenerational trauma? Yeah, I was consumed by sadness. Now I'm working on acceptance and deciding how and where I can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a lot of work to be done. So mm -hmm. that's what we need to concentrate our efforts, especially here in the diaspora. Um, Lindsay, do you, do you see any other questions? Should we? I don't think so. I think we addressed a lot of the good questions. I think we addressed them all. And and also, um, please feel free to email us um, at awainternational.org. Um, yeah. yeah, I want to personally thank everybody, the panelists. You you ladies did a tremendous job. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the great questions, the feedback from the audience from all over the world. Um, and uh, please look out for future AWA events. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram. And if you're not an AWA member, we encourage you to join us uh, and become part of this great community of Global Network from, like I said, we had women here from everywhere, from Germany today. Thank you, Julia. Our goal is to engage communities, enable connections, enhance well-being, stay well, stay safe, stay healthy, informed, and relevant. Thank you, everyone and hope to see you at the next webinar and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.